We have been investigating the consequences of global warming, and we have looked at the level of risk that we are taking. We are taking a risk that we should not be taking, and the outlook for our future is not good. So what do we do about all this? The answer is explored over the next four segments and involves a commitment to living mindfully. So welcome to part two. It's called Living Mindfully. It's going to talk about, well, what do we do about what we just heard. Mindfulness simply means to be aware, or you could say to be awake. In fact, this goes back about 2,500 years. There was a very mindful guy that used to live around that time. You may have heard of him. He's called the Buddha. And he taught us how simply to be awake. His name actually means the awakened one. So what we need to do today is simply to wake up to the fact of what's happening around us. And there are three key practices that I'm going to suggest or offer today, key mindfulness practices. The first is just to be mindful of what we consume. The second is to be mindful of how we vote. And the third is to be mindfully communicating what we know to other people. Now, in life, there are things you can do that have a big impact, and there are things that you can do that have a small impact. And also you'll find there's things to do that are really hard to do, and there are other things that are easy to do. And given the choice, probably the thing you want to do is do the things that are big and easy. I mean, it's okay to do hard, small things, but why would you spend your time doing something that has a small impact and is really hard to do? So why not let's spend our time here in the corner that's big and easy. And that's what these mindfulness practices are like. They have a huge impact on the environment, and they're all easy to do. The first big and easy practice that we'll look at is the practice of mindful consuming. Now generally when I ask people what do they think the number one cause of global climate change, they'll usually say transportation, driving of cars. And that is big, but it's not the number one cause. The leading cause of global climate change is actually the consumption of meat. The IPCC ranks the raising and eating of livestock to be the number one contributor to global climate change. 9% of all the carbon dioxide but 18% of the greenhouse gases comes from the raising and eating of meat. Now, carbon dioxide is not the biggest. The cars emit more carbon dioxide, but remember, methane is also a very important greenhouse gas. And cows have four stomachs, basically cow farts, <laughs> are one of the biggest problems that we have right now in the world. So the thing is not to eat cows. And Betsy here would kind of agree with that. <laughs> this is more than transportation. All of transportation around the world contributes 13% of the greenhouse gases. Eating of livestock is 18%. Cows are the single biggest contributors, followed closely by pigs, and then larger animals. So basically, the larger the animal, the bigger its carbon footprint. The smaller the animal, the less the carbon footprint. And just some other little factoids about livestock. 70% of all of the land that we cultivate go to feeding of livestock. And 50% of all the water that we use goes to the raising of livestock. Also, cattle is probably the largest single source of water pollution. All the biotics, the antibiotics that we put into their feed, all the nitrogen that goes into the growing of the grains for the cattle industry, all that runs off into the waters and creates huge dead zones all over the world. One kilogram of beef emits more greenhouse gases than if you were to drive for three hours while leaving all your lights on back home. I think it was Bill Mayer who just said recently that it's better to have a salad in your Hummer than to have a cheeseburger in your Prius. <laughs> <laughs> Organic beef raised on grass instead of concentrated feed emits 40% less greenhouse gases and consumes 85% less energy. So if you have to eat beef, eat organic beef. It takes seven kilograms of feed to create one kilogram of beef. Seven to one ratio. And again, if we're going to have lots of people starving, we're going to have 50% less food. Rather than spending seven kilograms of food to a cow, let's keep it for the people. Pigs are next. It takes three kilograms to raise one kilogram of pork. And then you get chicken, poultry. And then you get non-meat-eating fish. So basically, another, a good rule of thumb is, and this came from one writer who said, I don't eat anything that I can't bench press. And a cow weighs more than my Prius. Now, I can't even bench press a pig. A chicken I can handle. Now, I can bench press a chicken, no problem. <laughs> Maybe a small lamb, I can bench press that. But, but basically, the smaller the animal, the better. So if you agree that this is something that we can do something about, here's a resolution that I'd like us to share. 
Aware of the damage and suffering caused by the consumption of animal and animal products, I resolved to reduce my use of meat, meat products, dairy, and fish. Dairy is also requires cows. If you eat meat every day, which most North Americans do, in fact, the average North American diet has meat three times a day, choose at least one day each week in which you'll eat no meat or dairy. That reduces our greenhouse emissions one-seventh. So 18% goes down by one-seventh. That's about 2.5% right there. Now, most people I talk to who do eat meat regularly, when I ask them, could you have a meat-free day? And they say, yeah, that would be easy. Well, how about two? How about three? And most of them kind of draw the line at half. I could probably eat half the amount of meat I eat today. Half the week I have meat, half I don't. If we all did that, we reduce greenhouse gases by 9%. Now, I'm not saying never have a beef jerky. I'm not saying never have meat. That's probably going too far. Some people need to have meat. But we can reduce the amount of meat we have. If you have meat-free days already, increase the number of them. If you do have to have meat, eat smaller meat. Avoid beef and pork at all costs. They're the worst. Make sure if you're going to have beef, it's organic, locally grown. The further away the meat has to come from, the bigger the carbon footprint. And if you switch to fish, eat the smaller fish. It's got less pollutions in it anyway. And more locally sourced fish, what we call green fish. Green doesn't mean that they're colored green. If your fish is colored green, you probably don't want to eat that fish. But if you don't know what a green fish is, you can check seachoice.org for a list of green fish. So this is big, and it's easy. Right here, we can all agree just to have half the amount of meat we're having now, and we'll meet the Kyoto Accord. Let's look at mindful traveling. Traveling is the second biggest cause of greenhouse gases. In the US, one third of all the carbon dioxide comes from transportation. And worldwide, 13% of all the greenhouse gases come from the moving of people and goods. In the US, 20% of the carbon dioxide just comes from the small trucks and cars, basically our personal transportation devices. There are some very easy alternatives here. Walking. 50% of all the trips in North America are three miles or less. 28% of the trips are one mile or less. Most trips are to the mall and back to pick up your DVD for the evening and come back. And then you go to the mall to pick up your beer and you come back. Then you go to a store again and pick up your Pringles. And now you're ready for the evening. Most of the trips are a mile or less. If it's longer than a kilometer, then bike. The bike is the most efficient machine we've ever invented in terms of energy versus distance traveled. In fact, Lester Brown, who wrote Plan B, says, I get 10 kilometers to the potato. <laughs> so it's a very efficient form of transportation. If you've got to go further than five kilometers, or maybe it's raining, then take transit, or carpool, or share with friends. Or now there's all these car co-ops that you can rent a car for the day. Down here, we see a, a, a chart here. And this shows how many grams of carbon dioxide and nitric oxide are emitted per passenger mile. This comes from a study in the UK by the Tyndall Climate Center. And at the top, you see is air travel. Air travel is the worst form of travel in terms of our carbon footprint. Cars are the second. And the car varies depending on the type of car you have. A distant third is train and then mass transit, the bus. So if you have a choice, rather than flying to Seattle, it's better to drive to Seattle, better to take the train to Seattle or the bus to Seattle. Now, sometimes it's very hard to take a train. If you're going from here to London, England, it's not very easy to take a train across the Atlantic. So sometimes you do have to take an airplane. And air travel, if it's unavoidable, you can still do something to reduce the carbon footprint. You can buy something called carbon offsets. Now, a carbon offset is where you pay somebody else to take out of the air the carbon that you would put into it. Now, you have to be careful when you buy carbon offset. There's a lot of scams going on. You have to make sure it's something that wasn't going to already be done, like the planting of a tree. A lot of people are planting trees anyway, and they're thinking, well, since I have to reforest this place, maybe I can get people to pay me to do it. They're going to do it anyway, so that's not a net carbon reduction. And trees are not a great offset, because the tree eventually is going to decay. It's just a temporary storage away. In 20 or 30 years, that tree might get cut down again and burnt. So you want to get real good gold carbon offsets. And if you're not sure where to get these, you can go to the davidsuzuki.org. Uh, website. The David Suzuki Foundation has uh, books that you can download online that talk about where the best place is to get the gold standard carbon offsets. So if you agree that this is something that we can all do something about, here's the resolution that we can make. Here's the mindfulness practice we can commit to. Aware of the damage and suffering caused by the emission of greenhouse gases 
and pollution caused by transportation, I resolved to reduce my use of cars and to travel by the least destructive means. Again, I'm not saying never drive, but have a no car day once a week. If you drive a car every day, choose at least one day a week in which you'll not use your car. Decide you're going to walk, you're going to bike, you're going to take public transit, you're going to carpool to work. If everyone did that, that's a one-seventh reduction in the 13%. So that's like about 2% reduction right there. If you already have car-free days, then increase the number of them. Again, most people I talk to could probably get around not using the car two days a week. So that's a 4% decrease. Add that to the 9% we did from not eating meat. We're up to 13% decrease in our carbon footprint right there. If you must use your car, don't make three trips. Make one trip. Stack up the things you have to do, the chores you have to do, and just go once. If you're getting a new car, look into getting a gasoline, gasoline-free car or a hybrid. And for short trips, walk. It's the healthiest thing you can do. For longer trips, use a bike or take transit. If you must fly, buy offsets, carbon offsets, gold standard carbon offsets. In fact, if you want, you can actually offset your whole carbon footprint for the whole year from everything you can do. You're allowed to do that. 